Insecurity in the eastern part of DRC has posed a problem for several decades now. The country has for 30 years cycled through iterations of conflict. The region is plagued with rebel groups, armed forces and distressed civilians. The ensuing crisis between FRDC in coalition with FDLR against M23 has fueled long-lasting geopolitical tensions between DRC and Rwanda, resulting in civilian displacement and attacks on the Rwandan territory. From his recent visit to Eastern DRC, Mark Hugestein, a freelance journalist, reports that the situation in the region is much more tense than it was previously. M23 anticipates an attack from FRDC and FDLR at any time. Mark has witnessed the FDLR militia recruiting soldiers from different parts of Congo. He has also had interviews with FDLR members that have been recently captured by M23. In this video, he takes us through the journey, proceedings and experience. He also refutes the controversial UN group of experts report, emphasizing inconsistencies and manipulation of facts. The situation now is much more tense than, uh, than it was before. Everybody expects uh, an attack from uh, FRDC, FRDC mercenary FDLR coalition. Um, everybody says that, you know, not only, not only on the spot, but also if you talk to people who are following up on, on the situation in the field, who know the situation in the field, who have contacts in the field, you know, they will tell you the same thing if they're honest. So, um, and we felt that when we arrived there. So the first thing we saw is that uh, the M23 is now in, in combat mode. So they're not hanging out uh, in Ruturu, they're not, uh, uh, they're not uh, socializing. Uh, they were not socializing with us as much as before. They're really busy. And you also see that the, the, their combat uh, staff officers, they're all in the field and they're all at the front line. So because they are expecting this offensive. So then the second thing I can say is uh, that, that, that changed a lot is that uh, between now and then, when we went the first time, now the EAC uh, forces, the Kenyans, the Ugandans and the Burundians are, are, are deployed. So this changed a lot. So uh, M23 withdrew from certain positions. Okay, of course they stay outside that area so because they're not stupid, they're not going to run away and, and just uh, leave it completely over to the AAC. So they stay and they observe what's going on. But in these zones where the AAC is uh, deployed, insecurity is growing. People are being, uh, being terrorized uh, at night by uh, uh, what, what they call there now Wazalendo. But Wazalendo is, uh, is another name for FDLR, Niatura, Mai Mai that comes in at night to terrorize the people. There are kidnappings. Uh, you know, standard prices are like uh, $2,000 for a motorbike uh, driver, uh, $2,500 for a, a bigger businessman. So there is terror. People are, people are scared because M23 is not in the, in the street view anymore. In a place like, uh, like Kiwanja or even like Rochuru. So there is bandits and also uh, it's, it's visible and people feel the threat of uh, the many youngsters uh, who are given now machine guns, AK-47s, by the Congolese government. They distribute them at random. So the insecurity is growing. So you know that in Congo there is only, way, only one way to make money as a youngster. It means if you have a gun, you can help yourself. And this is what's going on. So that's a, a second thing. Um, yeah, the third thing is also that um, if you talk to uh, um, talk to people of, of M23, uh, like uh, five, six months ago, four months ago, they were still hoping that uh, the Kinshasa government would negotiate with them. So now they abandoned that hope. They see that uh, it's not going to happen, that it will not happen. They were left out of most of the peace talks, like in, uh, in Luanda and in Nairobi. And uh, they saw that uh, the peace talks, like what's in Nairobi, uh, were like an open door invitation to other groups, you know, uh, like uh, Kodeko, like uh, like a lot of my, my groups, like uh, 
uh, Niatura, and, and etc. So that we're going, coming there, and they're now fighting under the banner of uh, F FRDC. So, um, yeah, that's uh, that is changing. So everybody knows more or less that the bigger war is in the making. Everybody is waiting. Uh, um, so that's um, that's it, and you know they're ready for it. I have to say, yeah, we met with the FDLR people. These FDLR were, I just have to put it straight, these FDLR were uh, prisoners of war that were taking, taken uh, the last couple of weeks. They, they were, you know, the last month, maybe some of them during the last month, uh, even a couple of them we talked to, they were taken like, like two weeks, 10 days ago. Uh, from places like uh, Masisi, Mushaki, uh, also uh, Mabenga, etc. I also have to say that the insecurity, uh, before I, I come to the, to the FDLR, the insecurity in, in, uh, in the region is, is also growing because of the, the, the partial deployment of EAC. Like uh, a town like, uh, or a village like Kishishe, where we went uh, the first time to, uh, to find evidence about this so-called big massacre that, was, uh, 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 that happened there. So um, the, the Kenyan troops were, no, and Sudan, Sudanese troops were supposed to, to deploy there. They didn't come. So that left the gate open for the FDLR and Niatura to, to, to go back. And, and what do you see? Because we talk to people on the spot by phone, um, you know, and they tell us that the insecurity is total, especially at night, uh, that the FDLR and Niatura are moving in and out of, of the village. They're taking things from people. Uh, they're working again in their fields. They had their, um, which they're called domain, which is a big, big area where they're controlled by the FDLR. Uh, that was their, um, yeah, that was their garden, which they were cultivating, uh, you know, potatoes, carrots, uh, you call it. And, and they, they, they sold it on the market in Goma. Which like which like a million operation uh, business, so they're doing that again. So because of the 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 fact that EAC didn't deploy there yet, you also see that, um, for instance, Ugandan troops uh, on the field. I mean, we met them several times, and they didn't see us. You understand? No, we were not even really hiding. You know, but you know they only come out of their bases like uh, two, three times a day with uh, heavy armored vehicles. So you just hear them coming, yeah, and then you say, "Oh, they're coming," and then just to avoid uh, blah blah and discussion about what's this Muzungu doing here. This Muzungu just walked into a house until they passed, and he continued filming. So if a Muzungu like me can move in this region without being seen. How easy is it for FDLR and Niatura to do the same? They're just there to show the flag. They don't, they don't, they don't really protect the population. You know, and this is what the people were telling us. Yeah, what FDLR, I mean, I have to say that these FDLR, they were prisoners of war. Um, uh, most of them were um, captured really recently. So they knew really well uh, what is going on. Some of them were captured in Mushake, in the area of Kilorirwe, uh, Buiza. Uh, another one was uh, captured north of uh, Kiwanja. So, um, so um, yeah, we also wanted to interview FRDC soldiers, but uh, we talked to them. I talked to them before the interview, said, you want to do this? They wanted to do that, but they were scared because the, the uh, M23 also interviewed a couple of them uh, a couple of months ago uh, with cell phones and stuff like that. And then afterwards, their families, their relatives in Congo were being harassed. They said, yeah, your husband or your, your son is a traitor, blah, 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 because of the whole propaganda machine turning against them. So these people, they said, we can talk to you off the record, but we won't talk to you. Uh, you know, we don't like to talk to you uh, 
uh, on camera because our family might be might uh, might be bothered after that. So we respected that. But then the FDLR uh, wanted to talk to us. There was some several FDLR, um, and uh, we did. We talked to to five or six of them. But actually, we talked to many more because we also talked to others who confirmed what they were saying. So and five for us was was okay. So and what was their uh, narrative? Their narrative was that. Uh, and this was new for me uh, be because before I was more or less convinced that uh, FDLR was uh, mostly recruiting in circles of FDLR second generation in Congo. But nowadays, I mean, the FDLR is more recruiting in Rwanda. There's two ways. There is the direct way in which they convince youngsters to, to come over the border, which is really easy. All you need is a CPCL, uh, you know, and you can go to Congo. And then once they're in Congo, immediately they get a Congolese citizenships, citizenship, ID. They are given that and they join FDR. So the second thing is that uh, complete families are, um, are going over the border uh, to, to go and work in, in FD, FDLR zones. <clears throat> they promised them they can they can harvest uh, more more vegetables there and that they can do better business. So and they go for it and they take their children with them. Of course, their children are being forced into becoming uh, uh, soldiers. They get training and you know they get weapons and, and you know it's like that. This is also, but this is this was kind of new for us. And this goes hand in hand with other facts that we found uh, in, in, in the Mudende, Buna, um, you know, Mudende area, uh, etc., you know, and, and Kinigi area, that the, um, the, 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 genocide, the genocide lobby was becoming active again in this, in the, in the border area. So uh, we were doing investigation about the uh, uh, the case of uh, <coughs> a Rwandan who had fled to to Denmark for for because he had committed genocide crimes, so the Danish extradited him, extradited him. So and then we went back to the place where it all happened to find evidence about his case, um, and you know we talked to 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 ex FDLR who even had done 25 years in jail who are now released, you know. They told us a lot of things. They told us that uh, the, the FDLR, maybe not directly, but through you know, through agents, is is working on the local population. Again, they're quite active, and and even in the in the time of Chogum, they had plans to destabilize. Because how can you get straight away uh, a citizenship card? Normally, uh, you have to be. You have to be living in in uh, in that area. So, and why are returnees from from the refugee camps here when they go back to when they try to go back to Congo don't get these cards? You know, there is a big discrimination in who's going back and who wants what. Because if you want to fight for the FRDC, if you want to fight for the FDLR, they receive you with open 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 arms. Also what they told us is that the collaboration with FRDC and um, uh, Niatura and with the mercenaries is is open now. They're not hiding it anymore. So uh, they also told us that uh, the last uh, six months, eight months, a lot of weapons are being distributed uh, in uh, in the area. Some of the uh, one FDLR told me told us that uh, um, before, if you were if they were collaborating with Niatura, the Niatura only would have uh, machetes, and a couple of them would have a machine gun. Uh, nowadays, they all have machine guns and and bullets. You know, that's it. They're moving also on to uh, M23 positions. M23 knows this because uh, they have informants as well in FRDC and even in FDLR, Maneko, you know, who tell them what's going on. They can also observe 
certain things because M22, they also have their guys in these areas who inform them. So they know exactly what's going on. And they know that nowadays uh, uh, FIDC uh, together with uh, FDLR and also with, with the help of these mercenaries are moving on to M23 positions. They're bringing in supplies immediately behind the attack line so that in case when they launch an attack, they won't fall short of supplies. So they're preparing this. This is a strategy. There's also mercenaries are moving in heavy artillery uh, to 120 millimeter, very, very uh, ca uh, cannons, uh, uh, also uh, uh, some, some tanks, things like that, into position. So it's all there. And especially the areas where this happens, first of all, are the areas that are under the control of the Burundian uh, EAC. We asked them, said, who wants to be interviewed, you know? And then they were, they were not forced by the M23, you know? They have, but they have another, um, they have another view on things than the, the FDLR first generation, who came from, from Rwanda and who had this uh, ideology of genocide of that time, yeah? Um, these guys, they have these stories from their parents, of whom a lot of them committed crimes, uh, uh, genocide crimes in, in 1994. But also, they get these new theories pumped in their head of uh, a new Hutu, Hutu mentality, ideology, they even talk of, you know, of their own language, which is Kenya Rwanda, but it's a, it's a different, I think it's a different dialect, but not really different, uh, you know, like with, with other accents. I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm not a Rwandan. I mean, I, this, you should ask to Adeline, but, but uh, uh, and, that, and what they tell them is then, okay, we first deal with the M23, and then we all go back. Then they fall again on the old theory these genocidaires had of moving back into 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 Rwanda, uh, you know, in, in a big group. So that's it. And also, don't forget that um, these people in in uh, in 94, 95, especially this is different with the whole Muchengezi uh, revolt, 95, 96 when they were infiltrating uh, the north of the country and, and staging ambushes and things and killing people. It's different because they don't have the number of people anymore to do that. In the meanwhile, most of the, the, the Hutu refugees in Congo, they came back voluntarily. So like Victoria Ngabire is saying, and it's really funny that uh, before uh, resolving the problem in Congo, Kagame should address, uh, you know, the situation in Rwanda and um, and start up a dialogue between the Hutu opposition and, you know, the, the government, yeah? <clears throat> this is not an argument, according to me, that, that doesn't make sense because basically the, the, the Hutu extremists that stay, in, that stay in Congo are a minority. There are not so many of them. They just scratch left and right, you know, and with fake arguments, they get people to Congo and uh, to turn them into FDLR fighters or people to work in the fields so that they can continue their, you know, their Makala business and their, their you know, their, their, their fields and things like to work on the fields. So th this is, these, these arguments don't make, don't make sense. Yeah. They have the allowed growing numbers uh, uh, recently. So according to what I know, they, they did a lot of recruitment uh, the last year. So when, uh, and, and also to, to understand well the dynamics of the FDLR, you have to go back into uh, the recent history of the region. You also have to look back at the problems that there were between Rwanda and, and Uganda because the Ugandans, just to, to provoke the Rwandans, also started financing and giving weapons to the FDLR. 
agreement. But then there was an agreement between Rwanda and, and, and in Uganda. So the Ugandan stopped doing that. And that was the point where uh, the FDLR started, you know, attacking, you know, M23 and started getting plans again to infiltrate Rwanda. And this is also the moment when Kinshasa started pointing their arrows at the M23, you know, trying to, to, trying to convince the, the outside world that all of them were, were Rwandans, you know. So, and, you know, Makenga and, and Co, you know, they had to fight back. So, and fighting back for them was not a problem. I think the FDR grew in numbers. Um, I, I don't have the exact figures, but my, my, uh, my, I, est I estimate them at, at like 2000, like one and a half year ago and four to 5,000 nowadays. And don't forget, you know, uh, don't forget also the Niatura, who were really not, not more than a militia, badly armed and badly trained uh, uh, one and a half year ago, but of whom most of them have also weapons now, and the Mai Mai. There is like a militia, it's called uh, Pareko. Pareko is like, uh, you know, like Mai Mai. There are not so many of them but they're really well equipped. They're really radical. They kill people, you know, also don't forget, you know, and these, these guys are part of this, uh, this group of uh, FRDC proxies, which you can't really tell the difference anymore between who's who, because they all wear the same, uh, the same uniform, you know? So I think four to 5,000, four to 5,000 FDLR, uh, plus uh, a couple of thousand of really well equipped Nyatura, plus a couple of thousand of well equipped uh, uh, Mai Mai. Uh, and then, you know, the, of course, the, the, the mercenaries who are everywhere now at the front line because there is now uh, the official, the more or less official figure that I saw is that now 1,200 uh, mercenaries on the ground in, in and around Goma. So these guys, it's already, the number is already too big uh, to, to say that they are just there for instruction and, you know, uh, for more technical, technical jobs like uh, driving tanks and, and you know, um, reading radars, uh, things like that, maybe flying drones. So, and the, the number is going up to 2,000. And I think that Kinshasa, I heard that Kinshasa even have plans, have plans to bring it up to 3,000. I mean, this, I think it's a misconception to say that these people are Wagner, although it's possible that the group they work for, which is called Agamira, has connections to Wagner and is functioning in more or less the same way as Wagner. And it's possible also that some people in this, this group from, from, uh, Romanian uh, French guy called Mr. Bazin, yeah, also served in Wagner before. So they uh, they come mainly from Romania, uh, East, uh, former Eastern Bloc countries like uh, Belarus, Romin uh, Romania, uh, George, uh, Georgia, um, uh, maybe Hungary, uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, countries like that. There might also be some Russians inside, I don't know. So, so these guys are there, for, are there for money. But the M23 is not so much bothered about these mercenaries because they know that uh, once the fighting starts and once they start killing these guys and once they start, you know, uh, capturing them as, as prisoners of war, you know, they will be really quickly discouraged. And also in the case of an open conflict war uh, with Rwanda, they will be fairly easy to target. So this is the other thing that is a, is a risk, uh, is that uh, uh, Congo will, will try to provoke Rwanda into an open conflict. Hate speech is, is really, it's really important then that you also see different channels through which this hate speech is, is uh, projected on the population to, to the extent that uh, 
a lot of Congolese who were basically really good people are now under the influence of this, this hate speech. I, th I sometimes think about uh, the situation in, in, in Germany um, um, during and before the Second World War. Me personally, I have a lot of German friends because I'm, I'm a Belgian, I speak German. I talk to a lot of Germans who were talking about their parents and their grandparents, how, how, they, how it went under Hitler. I mean, they were not bad people. But they had this narrative pumped in their heads about, you know, Jews and, you know, about uh, communists and about uh, how bad uh, the Americans were and, you know, and how superior they were themselves, that they started believing this. So the same is, 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 uh, is happening now in Congo. And I think the, the Congolese Ministry of Information, you know, from, from Patrick Muyaya, is playing a really big role in this. Together with um, uh, organizations like the Société Civile, organizations like Lucha, which is a human rights uh, uh, organization uh, of youngsters who, who might have very good ideas, and who's also reacting against corruption and about you know, things like that, and about the discrimination, other discrimination, but who took over this narrative of, of the Congolese government also know that um, this, is, um, this goes along with uh, the, the whole uh, propaganda mill that comes from, from places like Brussels. Uh, and you know, you might say that, okay, Twagiramungu, uh, Fustan Twagiramungu is an old crocodile, he's just talking on, on social media. But this whole social media campaign is influencing also gave the Congolese maybe extra arguments to build on their propaganda campaign because it's really anti-Tutsi. If you look for instance at M23 and uh, Adeline can confirm this and, and not only Adeline but also uh, other people you know, you know they're not only Tutsi. Okay Tutsi is maybe uh, there are many Tutsis inside M23, but you also find Munde, you find uh, you find Hutu, you find you find uh, 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 Bashi, you you even find find people from Bakongo, <laughs> Kasaya, you know. So they're also there, of course. The majority is Tutsi, and then it becomes really easy to to convince people in Kinshasa at 2,000 kilometers of the place where it all happens, that these people are Rwandans. Even for the American government, um, the Belgian government even, you know, and some other governments are accusing now the Rwandans to actively support M23, you know. There is uh, several things that can be said about it. And that's also the narrative of the <coughs> Congolese government. And the biggest idea behind this, to back this up, is the fact that M23 is and was fighting like an RDF unit, with the same discipline, same motivation, the same mobility, the same uh, roughness the same uh, disrespect for their own safety in an attack. You understand? So, and the other arguments they, 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 they showed us, they showed us pictures of RDF crossing the border, so-called with, with satellite. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if we, and you can ask Adeline and, and, and even Gatete and other people who came with us, and other vi people who visited the areas, Basically, all the soldiers you see now are wearing the same helmets, yeah? Are wearing the same plastic boots, yeah? Are wearing the same uniforms. You know, if, if, if Rwanda is being provoked now, if there is one bomb falling on, on, on Kigali or Giseni, the shit will hit the fan. I, I think so. Maybe not the first one or the second one. I mean, 
they're not going to take it, you know. They're not going to accept it. That's one thing. Secondly is that the, the uh, what I also can say is that the, the mutual moral support between M23 and, and a lot of Rwandans is very big. You understand? So it's like the whole Rwandan community and also there are also Burundians, never forget. You know, they're also Burundi. You know there's Burundian M23 soldiers? You know that? Guys that were throwing stones at, uh, at uh, the police in 2015 you know, in, in Burundi, in Bujumbura, who fled to Congo. Yeah. I don't know exactly how many, it's maybe not so much, but you know, they're there. So this, 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 this feeling of mutual defense to stay together to the Kuma is really strong. So they have, they also know that they can't bend over and withdraw because there is more at stake than just Congo. It's it's the because 23 withdraws in Congo that would open the door for problems also in Rwanda. They're watching what's going on and they're reinforcing themselves. They know everything. They're really well informed. They know a lot. Like we we know a lot. If I can call uh, uh, a guy who's working in the cabinet of, uh, of uh, Jean-Pierre Bemba and ask him, hey guy, you remember, you know, we had like 10,000 beers like five years ago and, uh, you know, what the fuck is going on? And he's saying, Mark is really serious. Bemba is afraid uh, that he will uh, lose credit because he might be asked by, by Chisekiri to, to do stupid things. And, you know, that can cost him dearly in the future because... This is not his end point, you know, yeah? Or uh, people tell me that uh, FIDC is, uh, is preparing an offensive, yeah? And if you phone the, to, to people inside EAC, they tell you the same thing. I talk to FIDC officers, yeah? You understand? We talk to Congolese, who fucking used to work for us as fixers in the past, who are now translators and fixers for the mercenaries, you know, openly on Signal and Telegram. You know, we did just talk, and they all confirmed this. You know, how easy is it for M23 themselves or for the Rwandan intelligence to know what's going on. <laughs> you understand that? You get the point. So, and also if you talk, if not only that, but then the whole diplomat uh, uh, structure. Of course, a lot of diplomats in Kinshasa disagree with diplomats in Kigali, which is normal because Kinshasa is uh, an easy zone for diplomats. If you talk to Congolese politicians, to Société Civile, they're all very open. They, 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 they sing like kasukus. If you make an appointment with them, they're already there five minutes, five minutes later because, you know, that's their style. They also expect something back, you know. But if you talk to, to people here, yeah, they're more reserved. You understand? A lot of diplomats here say they're very difficultly accessible. We don't know what they think, things like that. So it's more, so, but people who know the system well here, who are here for a couple of years, they learn how to maneuver and, and get information. And these people agree <coughs> with people like us who also know how to maneuver. You understand? And even diplomats in Kinshasa, they tell me, Mark, basically you're right, but there is one thing. We can't say that openly because otherwise, you know, our country will get trouble here. <laughs> these guys are funny. Okay, I cannot say that uh, everything that is written in these reports is, is, is wrong. 
But what I feel, uh, you know, and, and especially these people, they don't like us because we are like a, a flea under the collar, you know? Yes. You understand? So we tell, we give people other views. Like, like for instance, the whole Kishisha report. Okay. Patrick Muyaya together with, uh, uh, you know, uh, Nande extremists like... Uh, uh, Paluko and stuff like that, the former governor of, uh, of uh, who has his own my my group, was very active in the Kishishi area and he was making like shit loads of money there. Yeah. So they came up with three to four hundred people killed by the Rwandan army and by the M23. Yeah. The UN came up with a second report. They said more than 100 people killed. We went there. We found that there was maybe over, just over 20 people killed. That's what, what we could find evidence about. We didn't look at the killings outside Kishise, and we didn't look at the killings, uh, or possible killings that happened there before, uh, you know, when the FDLR was there. Yeah. So we came out with that report. So we blocked that, that rumor, that propaganda bull, bull, you know, bulb, yeah. So after that, it felt quiet. Now, they went back, even AFP, they went back there after us, yeah. They came up with the same amount of people killed as we, but they wrapped it up in a different way and they filmed some skeletons outside of the city to make it visu visually stronger, which was a manipulation of facts, in fact, you know. So we didn't do that. So, uh, but they came up with the same and said, oh, you know, after uh, other groups came up with 40 dead. Okay, possible, you know. Yeah. They were using the same witnesses as we did. But these UN experts, instead of talking to us also as a possible source, they never did. We wrote them a letter when we were writing the report. They never replied, first. Secondly, in the footnotes of their reports, they mention us as not trustworthy because there are indications that we are being paid by uh, the regime in Kigali and that we're working for the M23. As a journalist, I'm asking you, is this an argument because they didn't they didn't deliver proof or evidence of that you understand so we know that this is is is, is like this so human rights watch same thing and how do these, do these people um, um, operate like for instance the last report of UN UN group of experts they came up with uh, the fact and, and with details how FRDC is collaborating with, with, uh, with FDLR. But they did so while they had these elements already before and they didn't mention them in reports be in before that. Yeah? Because they couldn't do anything else. Everybody knows this. They even, other people are even better informed as they are. Yeah? So, but they did that. But they didn't talk about so much about other conflicts with the uh, Kodeko and, and your know, ADF Nalu and, and other my my group for they're doing in the region, about the 140 or 160 other conflicts that are going on. <laughs> you know, they 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 didn't put it in in perspective. Yeah, they didn't talk one word or maybe one word or two words about the mercenaries about the Burundians, what they are doing, you understand? This is, this is a mistake. If you want to be credible, and for, number four, I talked to Rwandan officials here really high up. Rwanda was not implicated, was not given a chance. No, not, to, not only to comment, but to be confronted with what the what they were going to be accused of. Before, the UN group of experts always came here to talk to them. They said, we found this, 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 this. What is your response? 
didn't happen this time. Yeah, but then there is something else. There is MONUSCO. These guys are even, you know, MONUSCO is a failure on all fronts and was a failure. Now people are saying, okay, they're going to go maybe in six months. Even me and Adeline, when we are moving around, we saw columns of cars, MONUSCO cars going up north through M23 territory. Yeah. Six kilometers convoy heading to Beni Butembo outside of Goma. And we were laughing, you know, with, with the M23 guys. Say, <coughs> they know that there's going to be a lot of trouble. They want to be out of Goma before they're blocked there. But not because they were afraid. No, they're, they're pulling a lot of the heavy material already out to other places where they can easily be be brought to, to Uganda and stuff like that, you know. So we saw that. So so we asked them to do, what are they doing? Yeah, I mean, they're going to Butembo, Beni, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. They go the highway, they go for, they go to Rindi, Rindi, they go up, things like that. So there is things they go out and then they, they MONUSCO was a failure on all fronts. MONUSCO was even spit out by the local population themselves. There were protests in, in Goma against MONUSCO. Yeah. So because they didn't they didn't do their jobs. So um, that's one thing. After that, when MONUSCO didn't work, it became uh, EAC. Chisikiri tried to to convince the East African community into coming to, to the region to do his fighting. That didn't work. Then he, they started pissing on the EAC officers' heads and accusing them of not doing their jobs. And the guy was just following their mandates. Nothing more than that. So then they tried SADC, SADC. And then the South Africans uh, said, yeah, we will come and, you know, blah, 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 with Namibia and stuff like that. And, and uh, with uh, which other countries, you know, there's uh, so we will go there. That also stops. No money. You have been in Cabo Delgado with me. What do we know of Cabo Delgado? The South Africans are nowhere and the Rwandans are doing all the fighting and are even cleaning their dirty, dirty laundry because they don't have the money to move around that day and they're not motivated. So how, how on earth can they deploy in the Kivus? The Angolans, who, to my opinion, never understood well the dynamics of the conflict in the Kivu, you know, their deployment would maybe be even disastrous as, you know, as the deployment of the South Africans. They also thought twice and they said, mm, they, they stopped talking. I, we, we don't hear them anymore, you know, with a good reason. Because not, there is it's very few Rwandan soldiers, I think, who can forget what happened in Kitona in, in the second uh, Congo War. The Angolans betrayed them. So, so, so that's it. And now we're there. And now we are at the point when we see Chisikidi relying on, on these mercenaries which history has proven in Congo that mercenaries never served their purpose there. So, and to my view, this is, you know, this is fake. But the worst thing is that the, for me, and actually there is also one thing that's really important. The, the, another important element in, um, uh, in this conflict is not only the situation in the field in which people get killed, and in, and in which if, if it explodes again, many more people will get killed and in which innocent people get killed and, you know, have their houses burned because simply they are Tutsi and, and, and have to flee again, you know. So is the, is the, is the whole media, the media attitude and campaign, yeah. Our position is really clear. We can't go to the other side. They call us terrorists and, and, you know, we enter Congo illegally and we go without visas and 
you know, they can, they can hit us with different sticks if they catch us.